that sounds simple, maybe, but is actually pretty bizarre and really fundamental to reality. Spin one half in quantum mechanics. Yeah, it's a big one. We've got some fascinating material here that hopefully cuts through you know, the usual intimidation factor and gets to the real heart of this quantum oddity. Exactly. Quantum mechanics uh, definitely throws us some serious curve balls, and spin one half is right up there. It's one of those concepts that just forces you to rethink your sort of classical ideas about how things work at the smallest scales. Right. So our goal today isn't just to define it, but to really try and understand what this spin one half label means for the particles that well, build everything. And why it's such a cornerstone. Precisely. Why it's foundational for modern physics and, you know, still yields surprising insights. Okay, so spin, the word itself immediately makes you think, I don't know, a tiny planet whizzing around, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That's the intuition. But right away, our sources are saying, basically, ditch that image. Yeah, pretty much immediately. It's a type of angular momentum, yes, but it's inherent to the particle. It's not from, like, physical rotation in space. Okay, so the analogy helps but only goes so far exactly it's a critical first step think of it less like that spinning top and more like an intrinsic property you know like mass or electric charge it's, it's fundamental like it just has it it just has it it's an internal angular momentum that doesn't need actual rotation classical angular momentum that comes from an object actually moving orbiting or spinning right. quantum spin is just there intrinsic right so no orbiting needed got it now the one half part that sounds really specific, like a very particular setting on a dial almost. Uh huh. That's where the idea of quantization comes in, right? What does that mean for spin to be quantized? Precisely. Quantization is, well, it's one of the absolute defining features of quantum mechanics. It means certain properties can only exist in specific discrete amounts. Not continuous. Not continuous at all. Think of climbing a staircase. You can only stand on the steps, right? Yeah. Not in between. Spin angular momentum isn't some smooth dial you can turn. It's locked into these set values. And for spin one-half particles, the one-half is literally the value of the spin quantum number, S. S equals 12. Exactly. Yeah. And I saw in our material, there's even a formula for the total spin angular momentum. If mm -hmm. you plug in S12, you get uh, 32 situs. Yeah. Now, the exact math isn't the main point for us here, but it really highlights that this isn't just some random value, is it? It's a precise quantity. Absolutely. That formula gives the magnitude the total amount, but the absolute key is that discreteness. It comes in fixed packets, like uh, light energy comes in photons, right? You get one photon, two photons, never one and a half. Oh, uh, okay. Similar <laughs> idea for spin. Similar idea. Fixed packets. Okay, so we had this built-in quantized angular momentum. Yeah. How does this actually, you know, show up? Yeah. When we look at it, this is where spin up and spin down come in, I assume. Exactly. That's yeah. the next step. When we actually try to measure the spin along some chosen direction, yeah. you can imagine setting up an axis, usually called the z-axis for convention. Right. We find that the component of the spin angular momentum along that axis is also quantized. It can only take on specific values. And for spin one half? For spin one half, those values are strictly plus 12 times s, which we call spin up, or 12 times the spin down. Often we just say plus 12 and nag is 12. So hang on. No matter which direction I choose to measure it along, I'll only ever get one of those two answers, up or down, along that specific line. That's exactly it. A perfectly binary outcome. No shades of gray, no in-between values when you measure along a defined axis. It just snaps to one or the other. It snaps to one or the other. The particle essentially makes a choice, or rather the measurement reveals one of those two states. This fundamental two-state nature is incredibly important. And one of the biggest consequences, as our sources really emphasize, is how it classifies particles. Mm -hmm. These spin one-half particles get a special name, fermions. Mm -hmm. So what defines a fermion and why is this half integer spin, this 12, so crucial? Fermions are, by definition, particles that have half integer spin quantum numbers. So 12, like we're discussing, but also potentially 32, 52, and so on. But 12 is the big one for matter. It's the most common one we encounter, definitely. Electrons, protons, neutrons, quarks, neutrinos all spin one half fermions. And what's truly remarkable about them, the defining behavior, is that they obey the Pauli exclusion principle. 
The Pauli exclusion principle, okay, that sounds important, like a strict rule. What does it forbid? It forbids, well, simply put, it states that no two identical fermions can occupy the exact same quantum state at the exact same time. Identical meaning same type of particle. Exactly, like yeah. two electrons or two protons. And quantum state means everything describing them, their energy, their location, or orbital, and crucially, their spin state. Okay, so let's take an atom. If I have two electrons, both spin one half fermions, and they're trying to sit into the same energy level. Yep. They can only do it if their spins are pointing in opposite directions, one up, one down. That's the essence of it. You got it. That principle is basically the architect of the entire periodic table of elements. Wow. It dictates how electrons arrange themselves in atoms, filling up those orbitals, creating the electron shells. Which gives elements their chemical properties. Exactly. Without the Pauli principle, all the electrons in an atom would just pile into the lowest energy state. Chemistry wouldn't work. Matter wouldn't have structure. We would just collapse. It wouldn't have the rigidity and structure we observe. It also governs how electrons behave in metals, leading to conductivity. It's fundamental to stability. That tiny one half has enormous implications for everything. It really is mind blowing how that one number cascades into so much structure. Now, okay, our deep dive also touches on something else that sounds really strange. How these spin one half particles behave when you rotate them. It's not like spinning a basketball, apparently. Oh, not even close, not in the slightest. If it, you take a classical object, like your basketball, rotate it 360 degrees. It's back where it started. Looks the same. Looks exactly the same. But for a spin one half particle, its quantum description, the wave function describing it, actually flips its sign after a 360 degree rotation. Flips its sign. Wait, what does that even mean physically? That sounds completely bizarre. It is deeply counterintuitive. Think of the wave function as uh, encoding the probability information about the particle. After 360 degrees, that mathematical description has changed its overall sign, become negative. Okay. To get the wave function back to its original state exactly as it was before any rotation, you need to rotate the particle a full 720 degrees. Two complete rotations. Two full rotations. It takes a double twist to get back to where it started, quantum mechanically speaking. That is properly weird. Has this actually been seen, like, experimentally? Incredibly, yes. Experiments using neutron interferometry, for instance, have directly measured and confirmed this 720-degree rotational symmetry. Wow. It's a direct consequence of the mathematical tools needed to describe spin, called spinors. It just hammers home how different the quantum realm is from our everyday intuition. That's definitely one of those facts that makes you just stop and, well, blink. Yeah. Okay, another key feature tied to spin one-half particles, their magnetic moment. They act like little magnets. That's absolutely right. They possess an intrinsic magnetic dipole moment. Even if they don't have an electric charge, like a neutron. Exactly. Even neutral particles like neutrons have a magnetic moment. That seems odd at first. But it's because they aren't truly fundamental. They're made up of smaller charged particles, quarks, whose spins and charges contribute. Ah, uh, okay. So the internal structure matters. It does. So these fundamental building blocks, or composites like neutrons, act like tiny, tiny bar magnets. And this inherent magnetism is how they interact with external magnetic fields. Right. And this leads to a famous experiment, doesn't it? Stern-Gerlach. Precisely. The Stern-Gerlach experiment was a landmark. They took a beam of silver atoms, which happened to have one outer electron, giving the atom a net spin one half, and they fired this beam through a non-uniform magnetic field. A magnetic field that gets stronger in one direction. Yes, inhomogeneous. And what they saw was a direct consequence of this quantum spin and its associated magnetic moment. The beam didn't just spread out. It split into two distinct beams. Exactly. One beam deflected one way, the other deflected the opposite way. Nothing in between. Which matched the spin up and spin down states. Perfectly. It was undeniable direct evidence for the quantization of spin angular momentum. It showed the magnetic moments and therefore the spins could only align in two possible ways relative to the field. A huge confirmation for quantum theory. So cool. Okay, our notes also briefly mention the, uh, the mathematical framework. Things like Two component spinors and poly matrices. Sounds like we're getting into the weeds there. We are just touching on the language the tools physicists use to actually calculate and predict things accurately. The spinor, this two component mathematical object, is what holds the information about the two possible spin states up and down. Okay. And the poly matrices are basically specific two by two matrices that represent the act of measuring spin along the x, y, or z axis. The math can definitely get complex, no doubt. Right. 
But the underlying idea is simply that these are the mathematical structures that correctly describe this two-state quantized angular momentum and its weird rotational properties. They work incredibly well. Okay, so let's try and pull this all together. If we had to summarize the absolute key takeaways about this fundamental spin one-half, what are they? All right. Uh, first, it's a fundamental quantum form of angular momentum. It's intrinsic, not classical rotation. Got it. Built in. Second, it's quantized, specifically manifesting as only two possible states when measured along any axis. Spin up, plus 12, or spin down. Binary choice. Third, particles with the spin are called fermions, and they obey the Pauli exclusion principle. Which is huge for structure. No two identical fermions in the same state. Absolutely crucial for atoms, chemistry, the stability of matter. Fourth, they have those bizarre rotational properties needing 720 degrees to return to the original quantum state. Double twist. And fifth, they possess an intrinsic magnetic moment, making them act like tiny magnets and interact with magnetic fields, as seen in Stern Gerlach. It's just a cornerstone concept, foundational for the subatomic world. So, okay, in a nutshell. Yeah. It's quantum. It's got two states. It dictates how particles arrange themselves because of poly. It needs that weird double rotation to get back to normal. And it makes tiny things act like magnets. That's a pretty good nutshell. Yeah. That is a lot packed into just spin one half. It really is. It sounds abstract, maybe, but sure. its consequences are everywhere in the world we see and touch. And that really brings us to a final thought for you listening. Just take a moment and ponder this. Mm -hmm. This seemingly bizarre, almost... I don't know, whimsical property of fundamental particles, the spin one half thing. It's the underlying reason why the world around you exists the way it does. Mm -hmm. From the solidity of the chair you're sitting on or the ground beneath your feet to the incredibly complex machinery of life itself, it's all ultimately built on these tiny particles having this peculiar quantum trait. It underpins so much. It really makes you wonder, doesn't it? What other fundamental, maybe equally strange quantum rules are out there? Quietly shaping our everyday experiences in ways we haven't even begun to grasp yet. It feels like a universe still brimming with hidden depths. Definitely food for thought. Thanks for taking this deep dive with us.